Okay, so I think we are now ready to start the last session of this year's seminar, Explanatory Inference. So it's our pleasure to have today Bogdan Disher, who's a researcher at the University of Lisbon. Yeah. He's going to talk about non-foundationalist frameworks for meta-differentialism. So the floor, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, the invitation and thank you so much for uh, being here. Um, you know, particularly since I understand we are streaming, I don't know why this happens, it shouldn't. The reason since we are streaming, I should point out the fact that I'm contractually obliged to have some sort of logos on all my slides. Those are the logos of, my, of the entity that is funding me, whom shall remain unnamed. I do want you to notice the fact that the logos are there, very visible as per my uh, contractual obligations. Right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that said, uh, let's, uh, uh, let's move on. So, um, I didn't quite know what sort of an audience to expect, so I just sort of thought, well, you know, uh, I suppose it's going to be a sort of general uh, uh, audience of you know, competent philosophers. Uh, I'm fine with, you know, philosophers in audience. I'm a bit queasy about the fact that they are competent, but hopefully that won't be too much of a, uh, of a problem. Because I sort of decided that, you know, I, in various places I've said various things, generally nasty things about other people, uh, and I just thought, well, let's bring all this together. <laughs> yeah. In a sort of more coherent rant about other people. Uh, and I did a title for this, therefore I called it Non-Foundationalist Frameworks uh, for Meta-Inferentialism. Uh, right, this doesn't mean anything, but I can do a bit better. Okay, so here's what I want to talk uh, about. In a couple of uh, joint papers with Francesco Paoli, we pushed for a sort of understanding of uh, consequence relations, which uh, we've dubbed meta-inferentialist, uh, uh, we dubbed a, a meta-inferentialist account of logical consequence. Again, I'll explain this in, in just a bit. Uh, but then, <coughs> I at least, I was a bit queasy about how much we've said in favour of that position from a sort of grand philosophical uh, uh, perspective. So I've tried to work my way from what we believe about consequence to something like a position, a philosophical position that, you know, makes those beliefs about consequence really shine. So it's a sort of process of engineering backwards uh, a uh, grand philosophical view uh, about things from, uh, you know, uh, minutia of logical, uh, logical importance. And now, here comes uh, meta-inferentialism in the form of MARC, which is really uh, an acronym for meta-inferentialist account of logical consequence. I am assuming uh, a bit of knowledge of the uh, of the sequence calculus in the in the background. This is not necessary, but it's sort of convenient for the explanation. If that's a problem, just stop me. Uh, I've got a uh, what's his name, a marker, and a whiteboard. I can be more clear about uh, all these things. So the traditional story is that logical consequence is a sort of inferential relation. So it's something like, well, you know, you can say that uh, A and B, A and A imply B, uh, uh, have B as a consequence. Right? So B is a, consequence, a logical consequence of uh, uh, a conditional that has B as um, a consequent and a certain formula that, that also happens to be um, the antecedent of that, uh, of that consequence. So really when we're saying that, you know, uh, A follows logically from B, or that B follows logically from A, all that you are saying is that there is, you know, uh, a valid inference from, a logically valid inference from A uh, 
too big. This need not be a primitive inference, it need not be a, a simple one, you can make it as complex as you want, so that uh, what I'm saying it makes uh, sense. And really, the, if you look extensionally at the consequence relation, there is really nothing more than the class, usually the set of valid inferences of, uh, of, the, of a logic. And the way you come to know uh, this uh, extensionally determined class uh, is by knowing things about valid inferences. Um, now this is easier to see in sequent calculi in which <coughs> traditionally you have this sort of so as traditionally interpreted, sequent calculi are taken to be expressing reified valid inferences generally. So if I were to write this in, in a sequent calculus, uh, I would write this as follows. A, A implies B, some sign which is called a sequent sign uh, uh, B. So what's a sequent if you don't know? Well, a sequent is simply a pair of collections of formulae, uh, which is usually written uh, by way of distinguishing a sort of uh, left-hand side and the right-hand side. And you can think of what's on the right hand, on the sorry, on the left-hand side as being the premises uh, of your inference, and what's on the left-hand side the uh, conclusion of your, of your inference. Now, why does this matter? Well, it, this is sort of nice because sequent calculi are actually the sort of calculi in which if you want to prove stuff, you are producing sequence out of sequence, right? So if you have a, a, a proof system, I obviously haven't brought my um, my, what's his name, my charger, sorry about this, uh, no, this is not what I want, I want power, can you see power? Yeah. I think it was there, uh -huh. back to, back to battery, but not click battery before, no, before that, click on the left, click battery left, on the left, left. Uh, yeah. Battery. Turn display off after never. <laughs> good. I think this should do it. Now, if I can. Right, good. Fingers crossed. So, uh, what I was saying is that in a sequent calculus, if you want to derive things from other things, what you are actually doing, you are moving between sequences, right? So, if I were to try in a sort of vanilla sequent calculus, say for classical or intuitionistic logic to prove that uh, B is a valid consequence of A and A implies B, I would have to apply a rule which well, basically looks like this, um, and which is called uh, conditional introduction uh, on the left. Um, right. Good. I mean, this makes sense. I mean, modus ponens, which is the rule here, is in fact a, a, an elimination rule for uh, uh, conditionals. Um, okay, that's a crash course uh, in sequent calculus. Uh, if you have questions, ask them uh, either now or in the Q and A. Whatever, whatever you want. I'm fine with being. Uh, being interrupted. So that's the sort of spirit in which one traditionally handles uh, a sequent calculi. You know, you take sequence to express reified inferences, which are, after all, nothing more than uh, you know, specific claims of consequence. Right? So a sequence says, tells you what follows from, uh, from what. Okay. So far, so good, but of course there's a problem with this, because otherwise I wouldn't be talking about it, right? Uh, so, here's a sort of range of problems. The first problem is that there's reasons to believe that valid inferences or sequence under-determine uh, uh, logics. 
Um, now, this sounds super fancy, but it's actually a very, very simple phenomenon with which you might already be familiar, though not in terms of uh, consequence relations, but rather in terms of theorems. So, if you are familiar, for instance, with the logic of paradox, Graham Priest's uh, logic of paradox, then you know that this logic has exactly the same theorems as classical logic, although its consequence relation is completely, uh, completely different. For instance, in classical logic, a contradiction uh, uh, entails uh, everything. Right? Whereas that's not the case in, uh, in LP. The same happens, for instance, with classical logic and the uh, sentential fragment of a very bizarre uh, logic called dual intuitionistic logic. That too happens to be a logic in which, uh, a logic which has the same theorems as uh, um, classical logic. Uh, the funny thing is that the same thing can happen with a valid sequence and valid meta sequence. Now, what's a, uh, what's a valid meta sequence? Well, or a meta sequence in general, a meta sequence is really what I wrote here. So you can think of a meta sequence as an inference between sequence, an inference between inferences on the uh, traditional account, or in other words, a meta-inference, which explains the title of the talk, meta-inferential this, right? I don't like that uh, terminology, so I don't like calling meta-sequence meta-inferences, mainly because I don't believe that sequence are uh, inferences. I, I don't buy the traditional interpretation, but it's pretty well entrenched. So I'm going to say meta-inferential this, and meta inference is quite quite often meta sequence is equivalent to uh, meta inference. Right. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details of how how this happens. Um, how is it that you know <coughs> a certain inference can be valid without the corresponding meta inference uh, also being valid? I'm going to ask you to take my word. Uh, on that, but if you feel like in the Q&A or whatever, you can ask and I'll tell you why this, why this happens. The, the phenomenon, for those that know, happens with, for instance, classical logic and the, something called the logic of paradox, which is uh, so, something called ST, uh, uh, logic called strict tolerant, which is a kind of relative of uh, uh, LP. Actually, I believe that it is LP, but don't tell that to anyone. Uh, uh, I said it in writing, so it's fine. Um, <coughs> okay, that's the first problem, a kind of under-determination. Uh, well, you know, sort of very mathematically precise as far as problems go. You can pinpoint it. Then there's another thing, uh, which I call fragmentation. So you might think that this view or this interpretation of sequence as a uh, claims of consequence is actually a kind of analysis of uh, the concept of logical consequence. It's a sort of formal analysis, but not, nonetheless, you know, an analysis of uh, the properties of, uh, of logical consequence. Well, if you think that, then you've got a bit of a problem in the sense that uh, there will be no such thing as a sort of general picture of the properties of the general uh, uh, sine qua non, as it were, uh, properties uh, that a relation must have in order to be uh, a consequence relation. Why? Because sequence come in many sorts and many, many fashions, right? Some of them require uh, that the left-hand side uh, contains, that the right-hand side contains no more than uh, one formula oculants, for instance. And that's a, that's a property of sequence, which you have to understand as a property of consequence relation. And the way you do it, you say, well, OK, fine. This just means that the consequence relation is single conclusion. Right? It might be that my sequence can contain more than one formula, or more than one formula oculants, or 
or whatever. And this again is a, a, is a substantive feature of uh, sequence in the sense that it matters. Uh, uh, these constraints matter, they will yield, yield different uh, logics in, uh, in many cases. <coughs> and if this is how your sequence looks like, then it's natural to take um, consequence relations to be multiple conclusions. Uh, uh, for instance, by the way, uh, if you only, if you are allowed only one uh, thing here, then you are kind of constructivist, uh, depending on what else is going on, uh, going on there. But really, what I'm trying to say is that the difference between, say, classical logic and intuitionistic logic, for instance, boils down to how big uh, the left hand, the right hand side of the sequence uh, can be. So, because there's many logics, I'm not assuming that one or more or none is correct. I'm just sort of, you know, looking at the world and I see that, you know, textbooks have, are talking about lots of logics, right? Uh, now, if you think that, if you, are, if you accept that sociological phenomenon, and you also think that sequence equals inference is a sort of reasonable analysis of consequence, then, at least prima facie, you are going to have to say that, oh, well, you know, there's many ways of interpreting uh, consequence, and there's many ways of uh, understanding consequence relations, and that might be a problem or might not be a problem, depending on whether you are a pluralist or a monist or so on and so forth, or whether you have a favorite logic uh, uh, or not. The main point is that the decision on that is going to lie outside information about sequence and outside uh, any sort of information that's carried by this sort of simple equation that says verified valid inference equals uh, valid sequence equals a true claim of, uh, of consequence. And this might be a bit of a, 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 a bit of problem. There's yet another one which I call indetermination. So remember we had underdetermination then we had fragmentation, now we have indetermination. And this has to do with the fact that many logics are such that they can be presented via sequence chemically that have different structural properties. Right? So I already mentioned the fact that you know, uh, no cardinality restriction in the succeeding on the left hand side uh, is generally a property associated with classical logic. Oh well, that's fine because you know. Classical logic actually has presentations uh, that uh, use only one uh, 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 formula in the in the succeed. I've already also said that oh look, you know, this is generally a mark of intuitionistic logic. Well, yeah, that's actually true, but you know, there are also presentations of intuitionistic logic that have more than one formula here. So, this means that uh, because it can happen that uh, the same logic has uh, diff structurally different uh, 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 sequence calculi, um, you end up with no determinate answer to the question, well, is classical uh, uh, consequence single or multiple uh, conclusion? Uh, I should add this, all these arguments are fairly weak. Uh, there's ways of going around them, but all of these ways are sort of very involved. They require a lot more work and a lot more information in order to, uh, 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 to get off the ground. Right? I'm working under the hypothesis, which is not implausible, that you know, sequence and sequence currently do provide for a kind of maybe deflationist in spirit, uh, analysis of logical uh, uh, consequence. I'm gesticulating scare quotes against deflationism. Uh, you know, all I'm saying, I, I, I really I should be saying lazy rather than uh, uh, <laughs> deflationist. Okay, now, if these are problems, then obviously uh, a meta-inferential account of consequence has to do away with them, right? I wouldn't be spoke, uh, speaking about it. And indeed, that's, that's, that's what happens. It turns out that 
if you uh, characterize consequence as a relation, uh, as you know, sort of derived or based or supervening, if you want, on uh, inferences between uh, between sequence, then you do get a sort of univocal uh, uh, and perfectly determinate uh, account of. Um, the properties of logical uh, uh, consequence parentheses. Uh, there's some people that disagree with that. They have reasons. They are very complicated reasons. But more importantly, these people are living in Argentina. <laughs> Argentina is very, very far away. Uh, therefore, I'm not going to get into that. But remember this as, a, as an asterisk. And uh, if uh, if you want to know more about that, you can ask me in the in the Q and A. Uh, so I was saying that you do get a sort of uh, uh, non-equivocal determination of, of, of consequence relations um, in is a typo there in this form in the form of a Tarskian consequence relation, which is the most familiar. Uh, account of consequence, what's a task and consequence relation? Well, it's not about sort of a substitution invariant, a bracket down, because I won't be talking about substitution invariants and what follows. Uh, so, a logical consequence relation is task, and if it's substitution invariant, that accounts for the logical bit. The reminder is that follows. This relation holds between a set of formulae as premises, a single formula. As conclusion, and you can put it as a single thing that doesn't really matter. And on top of that, it's also reflexive, so every formula entails itself is monotonic. If I have A entails B, then if I chuck in more premises, more things next to A, it's still going to be the case that B uh, follows, and it's also transitive, right? In the simplest case, if A entails B and B entails uh, uh, C, then A entails. Uh, See, this is Tarski's account of, uh, of consequence. And this is what you actually get in the case of sequent calculi. Now, it's a bit more. Here's how you get it. So, here's how you have to think if you want to, uh, to get it. When we are talking about consequence in respect to sequence, we are talking about the properties of this symbol here, right? When we are talking about the properties of uh, consequence in relation to uh, meta sequence, we are talking about the properties of this line here, right? So when I'm saying that this relation is Tarskian, what I'm saying is that this line here is uh, actually Tarskian has the, the, the Tarskian properties. Now, there's, you know, you, you can... <coughs> really, the properties of consequence are precisely the properties of sequent-to-sequent -sequent derivability in a, uh, in a sequent calculus. I'm going to skip about the footwork uh, required for uh, this. It's very elegant. It's not... Uh, it's very... Yeah, it's very elegant and therefore not mine. Uh, it's the work of Bloch and Jonsen done in a context of talking about you know, algebraic ability and stuff like that. Super elegant stuff, we can talk about it. Right, so let's recap, because this is just the introduction, as it were, and I'm already out of time. Um, this is the sort of uh, meta inferential account of uh, consequence relations. The view that logics are determined as consequence relations between sequence rather than as consequence relations between, uh, between formulae. Uh, this has the effect that, task, that, that consequence is Tarskian across the board, even importantly, even for the so called substructural logics. Now, substructural logics, let's simplify things. Even for subtaskian substructural logics. And you can think of a substructural logic as being subtaskian it has, if it has a consequence relation that's not taskian. So, for instance, if you don't have uh, reflexivity, if you don't have the rule that says that any formula entails itself, then that uh, logic is going to be uh, subtaskian because it's going to be reflexive, right? Uh, now, if you go meta inferential, you are going to get 
uh, full, the full complement of tasks and properties, even for uh, logics that inferentially are uh, uh, subtasks. Yeah. And this is where this version of meta-inferentialism differs from the one defended by my colleagues and friends in Buenos Aires. Uh, they think that you can have sort of subtaskian uh, meta-inferential logic, so I disagree with that. Um, okay. This comes at a cost, obviously. I mean, most good things, even if they're bad, come at, uh, uh, at a cost. Uh, the first is that you can no longer interpret sequence as claims of consequence or as logical inferences. Um, in the same way, you can no longer interpret structural rules as stipulating the properties of uh, consequence relations. But if you want to know more about what a structural rule is, you can ask me. It's basically the stuff that I was talking about uh, before, or rather a special version of the rules that rules and properties that stimulate the properties of, uh, of the sequence sign. Um, so this is a bit of a problem because these interpretations are, if not natural, then at least well entrenched. I mean, there's a, if, you, if you interpret sequences as uh, inferences, there's a very, very natural correspondence between sequence calculi, for instance, and uh, natural deduction, which is sort of illustrated there. But there's also a sort of almost as natural um, correspondence or relation between sequence calculi and axiomatic. Uh, systems of which I've said nothing before, and I won't, but if you want to ask, uh, ask. Now, it, alternative interpretations are available. Oh, I should know, I'm working on one. Uh, I like it. It's still not as natural as, uh, or simple as the, uh, as the first one. Again, Q&A. We need to manage this problem. And it's not too hard, seeing as a philosopher, therefore we are in the business of inventing problems, so it's not too hard to see that uh, this management might be uh, uh, problematic. Th the first thing that happens here is that you put some sort of distance, considerable as it was con conceptual uh, uh, distance between logic, logical practice, logical theory, etc. <coughs> and what I'm calling the phenomenology of vernacular reasoning, which I take to be kind of the object, uh, the target of uh, logical theories, the thing that logical theories are, uh, uh, are about. Um, which, some people might argue, should be at least an important guide the phenomenology should be at least an important guide in, in, in logical theorizing, if not an outright constraint on it. And historically, there have been arguments uh, to the extent that the way seemed to us pre-theoretically should guide our uh, uh, theoretical musings. I mean, if you know your Dummett, then you will remember that he goes on for pages in uh, <laughs> the logical basis of uh, metaphysics saying unpleasant things about multiple conclusion logics. Basically, it says, look, this is a sort of generalization of the regular, uh, theoretically induced generalization of the uh, uh, preformal practice, but it lacks any sort of rational justification, any sort of basis, it's part, you shouldn't be doing it. Etc. If you know your Gensen, then you know that you know when Gensen touted the virtues of natural deduction, one of the things he said was, "Well, this is the way mathematicians really think, right?" So this this way of presenting logics uh, against instead of natural deduction comes as close as possible to the actual reasoning of mathematicians. Things do seem that way, and a scary number of uh, people actually take the natural in, that, in, in natural deduction in a serious uh, way. I just don't understand what that means, but these people who apparently do, hopefully not here. Right, uh, so to make things worse 
for you, better for me, because you know I'm talking about more substantive stuff, if this is the case. You also have this sort of complication that the meta-inferential account of consequence, while neutral with respect to logic choice, right? We've just seen that there's lots of logic that can fit into that, uh, that pattern, is actually not a neutral account of the properties of logical consequence, right? Because it comes with the task and properties. Uh, so it's again kind of natural uh, uh, to think that well, if you're talking about such a substantial issue as the properties of a relation that's presumably the object of your analysis, then you'd better do some kind of analysis, uh, right, of the target system and, you know, sort of extract those properties uh, on, uh, on its uh, basis. Whereas we haven't said anything to defend uh, uh, meta-inferentialism that would come you know, anywhere close to being a substantive analysis of, uh, of reasoning, of inferring, of correct inference. I mean, what, what's the target of logic? It's, it's, uh, uh, what, what logic is a theory of? It's a sort of complicated matter, but we'll talk about it. Um, so this is an extra complication. Now, I shall argue that this is a complication only if one is a foundationalist about, uh, about logic. Now you might wonder, well, what's to be a foundationalist about logic? Well, worry not, because I've got things to say about that. Let's see how fast I can do it. Um, so, my argument obviously is going to be, well, you shouldn't be a uh, foundationalist about logic. I mean, if not for any conceptual reasons, then because it doesn't match, you know, with what I'm saying about logic, and that would really hurt me. Uh, I'm, here's what this particular ism means. It's nothing more than a sort of acceptance or adherence to what I call uh, the contiguity thesis, which is very simply put, the sort of general or broad idea that there is no kind of qualitative gap, distance or space, if you want, between logic and the facts, you know, the scare quotes, that logic is supposed to account uh, uh, for. Why the scare quotes? Because I don't want to do metaphysics. I just use facts in the sort of vanilla way. It's just the things that people take logic to be about. And there's, you know, been quite a lot, quite a lot of proposals as to what those facts might be and what logic might be a theory of. You know, Williamson says that it's reality after some fashion. Of course, he's wrong, unless him or uh, his uh, students are uh, in the audience, in which case, yeah, he's perfectly right. No. Uh, other people have, have suggested that, you know, really, but the logic, at the end of the day, you know, boils down to the semantics of natural language. Let's dumb it after some fashion. Other people like Graham, you know, talk, Graham Priest talk about vernacular reasoning. Yet other people like Burgess, I can't remember which version, I think it's Tyler, uh, but if not, Stuart Shapiro. Uh, talk about mathematical practice. All these being things that logic purportedly uh, is called to account for. Uh, just to simplify my life and to you know, sort of be in the realm of the plausible, keep the discussion in the realm of the plausible, I'm just going to assume that the facts in question uh, are facts about vernacular reasoning that are otherwise manifested in natural language, right? Because this way I don't need to worry about differences between linguistic and the mental and that sort of thing, or let alone reality or whatnot. So in this case, the continuity thesis just, because, just becomes the view or the claim that, you know, when you are doing logic, or rather that logic, you know, is really a sort of enhanced version of reasoning in natural language. Uh, if you want, you know. Whatever kind of phenomenon happens 
uh, in, the, in the vernacular, well, it's the same type of phenomenon that happens when you are you know, doing logical inferences in a formal system or uh, uh, um, whatnot. I mean, there's many things uh, that this might mean. Uh, I'm not going to get into a sort of very precise scholarly um, analysis of it. I'm just going to give you a few caricatures. Uh, of, uh, of the view. So these are sort of possible tenets of a foundationalist. Uh, it seems like, you know, logic isomorphically represents uh, uh, moves already present in the vernacular reasoning. Well, this is not precisely what Gensen said, but it's not all that far, right, what, uh, from what Gensen said about uh, uh, Natural deduction and oh right, do take isomorphically in the uh, uh, etymological sense, right? having the same form. Now, don't ask me what form is. Uh, I'm a logician. Right? I can write books about that, but I still have no idea what it is in this uh, in this sense. Then uh, you know you've got views like the criteria for logical correctness are already present in the, in. The, vernacular reasoning. So one version of it, or rather sort of a, 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 a gloss on this, would be that uh, you know, vernacular inferences are logically valid or invalid, irrespective of any sort of theoretical decision uh, about, about validity. Less radically, you might take this view to be something to the extent that, well, you know, logical validity is to be regulated via our strongest intuitions about uh, correct reasoning. Then you might think that, you know, the, the content of the conceptual apparatus that's deployed by logic to analyze uh, validity is essentially determined, again, by intuitions about um, uh, vernacular reasoning. So all these are foundational instances, and all of them are, um, I believe, to be rejected. And I'm going to very briefly sketch two simple, but I think compelling arguments against, uh, against foundationalism. The first is uh, Michael Glansberg's. Uh, it's a version of the no logic in language argument, which you might remember here, yeah, historically goes back to at least Ross. Uh, uh, in the 50s. The other is a sort of reductio of foundationalism uh, from logical, uh, logical nihilism. Another ism will get to that. So Glansberg's idea is quite simple, but I, I think very compelling. He's working in a sort of modern theoretic uh, framework, and it's, you know, the semantics uh, by way of roughly tasky and truth conditions. And he just points out that the semantic analysis of natural language is not in itself apt to support uh, uh, <coughs> the attribution of uh, logical properties to, to natural language. Why? Because, you know, logical properties are supposed to be general, formal, universal, etc. Uh, but when you, are, when you are doing, you know, Davidson's style, semantics of natural language, you are not doing that. Uh, so the, the, the difference, if you want, boils down to how you are use these truth conditions. You know, knowing what the cat is on the mat means in English actually means knowing the actual truth condition of the sentence the cat is on the mat. That's what you need to know if you are doing semantics of natural language. If you are doing logic, for instance, what you want is relative truth uh, uh, conditions, something like you need an account of what the cat is on the mat might mean if, say, a certain inference is to come out as valid under every interpretation, under everything that the cat is on the mat might, uh, might mean. So, really, Michael's point is that to get to logic, you need to abstract and idealize. Uh, uh, List. And then, you know, also your entire outlook is going to be quite, um, quite different. Right, and then there's uh, the sort of 
apparently compelling argument that contiguity uh, generates nihilism. So here's what logical nihilism is. There's a few versions of it. Um, the one I'm talking about is something that's been investigated by Julian Rox. I mean, she's actually flirting with it. You don't have to take it seriously. I think that that's wrong. Uh, so it's the view that because logic is general, universal, Validity is a, is a property that's supposed to be holding of every domain, in every domain, domainlessly, uh, um, uh, if you want. And because there's plausible evidence, then one can build counterexamples to pretty much every putative logical uh, law, provided that one looks at the right uh, uh, domain, then, uh, you know, there can be no non empty logic. Right? So, for every putative validity, you are going to find a counterexample. That's the, that's, the, that's the general idea. And that actually holds a bit of water if you are a foundationalist, if you uh, subscribe to the contiguity thesis, at least if you're domain of facts, of relevant facts, is natural language, right? Because natural language is messy, and there's really no reason to believe that it's not messy enough to screw up pretty much everything that you might try to do in, uh, uh, in your logic. Now, I actually believe that the problem is not so much that nihilism is wrong, which I think it's obvious, but rather the worrying about nihilism uh, is, uh, uh, is, uh, is wrong. Uh, simply because it feel it, it, this worry is generated by positing that there is no filter, uh, no work uh, going from the vernacular to the uh, to the logical. I mean, this is just the contiguity thesis. So you know, you start with contiguity, you end up uh, with nihilism. Now, what you want to do at this point? Well, I suspect that. Most of us would agree that the reason, reasonable thing to do is to perform a reduction and say, yeah, no, we've got to drop contiguity. I mean, otherwise, you know, we're going to be out of a job, uh, right? Because there is no logic, or rather, you know, every logic is empty. There's a bit more to be said about this. Uh, for instance, I very much think that this is that the nihilist conclusion is wrong. You know, you don't get to uh, infer that the logical consequence relation is empty, uh, so you don't get nihilism, what you get is anarchism, which is really the view that material validity and logical validity collapse. It's actually a lot more uh, plausible. And there's also the fact that, you know, uh, this would be a historically inaccurate description of the practice. I mean, when people done, have done logic, they've understood themselves to be operating with a sort of uh, uh, sanitized uh, version of the natural language thing. I mean, certainly Frege uh, thought of the Pregriffschrift as being that, you know, a sort of replacement of natural language that's apt to support logic. And there's many other people who, you know, reflectively, have uh, uh, pushed for the same same sort of idea of you know regimentation, sanitization, niceification of this jungle, which is uh, a vernacular reasoning. Okay, very quickly, fine. Uh, but if you drop contiguity, foundationalism, what what do you put instead? Well. There's not so many options. One thing to do, one thing you could do, is to think a bit more clearly about what this entire idea of you know, regimenting natural language might, uh, might mean. And the obvious option here is to sort of think of whatever it is when you are doing logic, or whatever it is when, when you are using a formal language, as being a kind of modeling process in which you are building uh, models of a certain phenomenon that's too messy to be uh, grasped 
as it is, that's fine. You build a sort of simplified model, you investigate its properties, and then perhaps you can move from those properties to the properties of your target system. And this is the sort of logic as modeling approach uh, which has been um, defended by Stuart Shapiro and Roy Cook. I don't like it. Uh, let's see why. So, this is an important, not merely motivational quote, so I'm going to go through it uh, 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 completely. See, Cook says that his PhD thesis in 2001, I believe, uh, the philosophical logician in, is engaged in a a posteriori scientific enterprise of describing mathematical practice. Notice that the facts that Cook's talking about are not here, the vernacular in general, but rather mathematical reason. Logic is a tool not for building foundations, but <coughs> um, for constructing models of mathematical practices. Uh, the actual day-to-day -day behavior of the mathematician is something to be considered as a natural phenomenon, to be described, explained, and perhaps uh, predicted and possibly uh, uh, improved. Logic is a tool for description, not just proscription. So this illustrates one way that you can think about this entire modeling, uh, modeling business. As a kind of descriptive uh, uh, procedure. Uh, and this, this part of it, this sort of epistemological descriptivism that I don't quite like, actually I don't like it, uh, uh, at all. Now let's see how this works because, you know, I have a yes. small question for verification. So there's pros proscription, is that the same as prescription? Or does no. it mean something else? Yeah, it means interdiction. So it's supposed to be a pun. Uh, oh, okay. It's not a typo. Uh, at least it's not a typo I did. If it's a typo, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, Roy. it's, it's Roy's. But I think he actually means proscription, it's prohibition. Okay, uh, I see. Uh, uh, it's, yeah, logic with the thing that there's uh, no reason like that, mm -hmm. and that actually makes sense because you know one of the one of the traits of the view would be a sort of, would be the rejection of revisionism uh, uh, about logic, and anything of revisionism as being you know sort of a proscriptive, not prescriptive, mm -hmm. proscriptive uh, uh, stance. So here are, here's how things are supposed to work. Oh, before that, so notice that. This might not mean uh, all that much um, because, you know, for one thing, I take this view that logic has a modeling component or dimension to be almost trivial. For another, there is a very informal use of the word model uh, that makes its meaning almost indistinguishable from the meaning of theory. So, you know, often when people say, oh, there's just a model of what they are meaning is something like, oh, I'm just giving you a theory of, you know. So what, what the zoologist does, some people might describe as being, you know, a model of tigers in the wild, right? That's not a model, that's a full-fledged uh, uh, theory. But the epistemological picture, which is highly descriptive, uh, and which repudiates the traditional normativism of, of logic is quite, it's quite prominent uh, here. And I would uh, urge you to keep, it, uh, to keep it in mind. I'm going to go five minutes over time, uh, I'm afraid. Uh, okay. Um, so here's how things work. Uh, I'm going to skip this part. Right. So they do, in fact, but, but Cook and Shapiro end up talking about models in a sort of more substantive uh, uh, sense, you know, in the same sense in which uh, a tiny car uh, made for various reasons can be a model of a genuine real, uh, real car. So the way things work is that a model presents you with a sort of dual, uh, uh, dual ontology. You've got things that are representers and things that are art. In, uh, in a model. So the representers are elements of the model that either correspond or, inten or are intended to correspond to real aspects of the, of the target phenomenon. So if you're thinking about logic, for instance, then you might think that you know, the sentential variables, I mean, these are meta variables, but 
on the whiteboard, but think of them as variables. Uh, that you might think that the sentential variables in the sentential language are representing natural language sentences, for instance, or you know, truth bears, uh, real truth bears uh, uh, in general. So that will make them represent this. Then, of course, you've got artifacts, which are sort of weird creatures that only exist in the model, that are generated by the model, that don't match, don't represent, don't sort of reflect in any way uh, a form of shape on the, on the target uh, 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 system. So if you know, this is the example they use, and it's actually a quite, quite good one. I mean, they're talking about vague languages. But we can simplify things. So think of the fact that we represent the truth values with the one and, and the zero, and then you know, starting from uh, assignments of truth values to uh, the, the sentential variables, we actually mathematically compute, for instance, in the case of classical uh, uh, logic, the truth values of the of the um, um, complex sentences. Now, the fact that you know we do some a bit of elementary arithmetic uh, in order to understand the truth value of a complex sentence is uh, artifactual, right? When you are reasoning about P's and Q's and O's and N's and N's, uh, you're really not doing uh, arithmetic, you're doing something else. But, you know, with simplified calculations in basic arithmetic, we can sort of mimic, mimic that quite successfully. Now, this is, very quickly, this view, I think, is problematic. So for one thing, they, they say that the uh, artifact represented distinction is vague. Uh, not just in the sense that I can pick uh, representers that are quite different from, from yours, that is a sort of inherent pluralism of any sort of modeling enterprise, but really the thing can be vaguely uh, described as you know, both a representer and an artifact. We don't really know which one's which. Uh, which simply brings about the question, well, why have it uh, uh, then? Why, why keep it? And the only rationale for keeping it is that you sort of want a kind of glue between your target phenomenon and, and your model, but there's really no need to advertise that group as being, you know, representer uh, uh, strong, when in fact it's not clear that the representer is not also a, 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 an artifact. Um, I also am a bit wary and worried about the fact that the view abandons the traditional uh, uh, prescriptive uh, aspirations of, uh, of logic. I mean, sure, we get a better understanding if we are doing intuitionistic logic of what intuitionistic mathematicians are doing. Fact, mathematicians in general, but intuitionists in particular, are weird. Nobody should have a better idea of what they are doing. They are just bizarre people. <laughs> I hope there's no... <laughs> That's a joke, by the way. <laughs> just, let's, uh, uh, let me clarify that. That's a joke. I actually believe that intuition is the one through logic that, you know, uh, it's uh, verification transcendent to prove it. Um, but this brings about the question of what exactly is the point of having something uh, uh, like a more abstract model of a practice if that model is merely of descriptive uh, uh, value. And that's a hard question. And I also have this lingering suspicion that the descriptivist epistemology, in a sense, renders the view just as foundationalist as, say, the semantic conception of logic, except for being, you know, less ambitious because it's descriptivist, right? It's not norm normative. Right? So instead of using meaning, for instance, as a guide to your reasoning, and you know, now I'm just accurately describing what you are meaning, and the, the, the only sense in which this can guide your reasoning is sort of accidental. If it so happens that you don't really know your meanings, 
and you need a sort of better uh, uh, grasp of them. And for all of these reasons, I'm just going to say pass. Yeah, no, this is, this is not the kind of view that a meta-inferentialist should, uh, uh, should endorse or should use to bolster the case for Mark. Do we have uh, an alternative? Yes, we do. It's called constructionism. It's a way better name. Um, <coughs> and it's, it goes a bit like this. Uh, Floridi, Luciano Floridi in a defense of constructionism. Philosophy as conceptual engineering. Parenthesis, the only bad thing about the view is that it's sort of connected with conceptual engineering, uh, which is a great idea, but if you know the literature, or rather the current state of the literature uh, on conceptual engineering, uh, then you know what I mean. I really should not say these things, but I can't help it, it's my nature. Uh, I ho hopefully nobody's online. Right, uh, so here's what, here's what Floridi says. Floridi says knowledge is not about getting the message from the world. It is further, first and foremost about negotiating the right sort of communication with, uh, with it. And if you remember the thing that I most dislike about logic as modeling, i.e. its sort of descriptive uh, orientation, uh, then you can kind of understand why I'm tempted by, uh, by this view, right? Because it says, look, this is not about getting what's going on in vernacular reasoning. That's not what a model, for instance, should be doing, first and foremost. Really what a model should be doing is sort of giving you the right tools for interacting uh, uh, with uh, with your target phenomenon. And, you know, luckily Floridi and other people see a bit more uh, 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 about, about all this. And in fact, what they do, they give you another sort of model of a model and another model of the sense in which logic might work as a model for uh, the uh, for vernacular reasoning. Uh, which in actual fact, might not reject descriptionist, but it's not married with it. It's not, you know, intimately connected with it. It, you know, it gives you the opportunity, the option, to step away from a, a very descriptionistically involved position. So, the thought is that one goes on to conceive of logics, on the whole, as artifacts of a certain kind. Namely, as a kind of cognitive technologies or tools uh, that are used to improve and correct one's inferential practices. Now, of course, when it comes to, you know, the sort of view, the sort of view like meta-inferentialism, you've got to, you know, climb a, 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 a round up the ladder, right? Because it's not really the actual inter interaction practices that are under debate here, but rather the debates about the inferential uh, 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 practices. But that's a sort of minor, minor, minor difference, right? Um, so the emphasis is on improving and correcting and generating a better understanding of the phenomena than uh, on uh, describing. Uh, uh, anything. And you still talk about models. It's just that you talk about models in a sort of different way. So here's the architecture of a model uh, and the role of a model in a theory, according to Floridi and uh, Patrick Allo. So if you want to talk about the target system, then you sort of need to decide at le what level uh, uh, you want to talk about. I mean, the simple analogy here is, you know, physics and chemistry, both are concerned with atoms, for instance, with substances, etc. They are not the same. Why? Because they are sort of operating at different levels of uh, abstraction, uh, uh, in a sense. 
Um, so what's the level of abstraction? Well, it's nothing but a collection of observables, which you, know, you can formalize as sort of type variables. Yeah. Good. Let x stand for cats. Let those things y from the y category stand for dogs, uh, and so on and so forth. Which is really the stuff you are using to uh, formulate a theory of the system you are, you are talking uh, uh, about. Of course, you also need to describe the behavior of these um, value of these uh, observables. Yes. Cats are afraid of dogs, or irritated by dogs. Uh, dogs chase cats. Uh, cats are way cooler than dogs, etc. Um, and this, you can formalize this as a sort of complex predicate. Uh, uh, in, uh, in, in your system. And it's important to know that the observables are not representers, right? There's no sort of assumption that they are intended to uh, stand in any sort of descriptive connection with uh, the things in your target phenomenon. Of course, in many cases, you may want that, so you might, as they say, moderate them so as to be realistic for the uh, 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 for the system, right? Uh, so this sort of means that, you know, if I'm, um, if my target system is human behavior, right, then when I'm picking my uh, observables, I'll make sure, for instance, not to have things like, uh, uh, measures that are incapable of expressing the <laughs> acoustic reception capabilities of humans. Right? This, this wouldn't be useful uh, uh, at all. So together, the behavior and the observables generate a model, which is sort of replacement object for your target, uh, uh, target phenomenon. And it's uh, an object that can be investigated and that yields a set of set properties, propositions, uh, about the model, importantly, which you can, in fact, attribute to the target, target phenomenon. And here's how things look, right? You have a level of abstraction that, alongside, you know, a, a behavior, generates uh, a model on the basis of which you identify some properties, and this is all theory, right? And those properties, which are properties of the model, in fact, are then being attributed to your uh, uh, target, target phenomenon. So a model is not going to be conceived as, first and foremost, an idealized description of a target phenomenon. Instead, it is to be conceived as an interface, i.e. a sort of uh, means of communication between two distinct, distinct systems, right? Uh, the system, the target phenomenon, or uh, in this corner of the diagram, and the um, theoretic system, uh, 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 as it works, that supplants and replaces. Uh, replaces it. I mean, this is just a very nice um, metaphor. All right, I've got. Uh... Okay, so with all this in mind, you can sort of see how, if I'm a constructionist, I can really blow the trumpet of the meta inferentialist account of consequence. Because now I can point to things like. Oh, look, this is a very flexible and very powerful interface. It can fit as many logical, well, not as many, but lots of logics uh, 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 in it, right, in a uniform uh, um, <coughs> framework. At the same time, I have the advantage by being a constrictionist, then you don't need to worry about the fact that, you know, I'm representing what appear to be influences between truth bears as a sort of influences between more complex objects that really aren't to be interpreted as uh, 
through that, i.e. sequence, because the nature of the sequence is not that of being, you know, true or false, or having a truth value uh, in general. It can, but it's not. So this, this means that we can enjoy all the theoretical benefits of, of meta-inferentialism uh, without worrying that they are obtained by theft instead of honest, honest story. And we can also defend it uh, in, uh, in a manner We can also defend the fact that it comes with a thick uh, notion of consequence, right? with, a, with a thick set of, uh, of uh, properties of the consequence relation, in, even without presenting that as an analysis of some target uh, phenomenon. Because it doesn't really matter. I mean, it doesn't matter whether your reasoning, Weber's reasoning, is Tarskian. Uh, or not. What matters is that being, you know, consequence being tasked is a powerful tool for understanding that uh, reasoning. And I sort of venture to say that uh, it's not uh, this, doing this, the, the construction is, is not going to uh, mean that we'll have to uh, abandon uh, the familiar tools of the foundationalist view. I mean, that's just because I'm writing a paper on harmony, which is uh, a very foundationalist thing, but that's why I need that here. Okay, so that's about all. Thank you so much. Sorry for the <laughs> Does anyone need a break, or can we do the discussion from now on? Yeah, I prefer right now, <laughs> personally. <laughs> Analyst. Okay, then who wants to uh, who wants to start? Okay, go ahead. <laughs> so, uh, thank you for the talk. Yeah, I, actually, I pretty agree with, with your idea. I mean, it's not so often like I totally <laughs> from you. Well, in my defense, probably not a single one is mine. Not a single idea is yeah, mine. No, I guess, I guess. <laughs> of course, it's not the only one. But I mean, uh, I pretty agree. I just wonder, well, two questions. What kind of uh, what would be the most appropriate maybe to, to to start this kind of what you call communication, probably call communication with vernacular uh, uh, reasoning? So do you think the classical logic is the most appropriate, or you can make some distinction? And also, I wonder if some other model, other than logic, can be useful to understand vernacular reasoning. And what, what part they have in the process? Yeah. Okay. So can I please start with a, with the second question, which has, a, in my view, a much clearer uh, answer? Now, if I'm to take your question seriously, then yes, of course, uh, there are other things that can provide a uh, model of vernacular reasoning. Uh, but that's not what you want to ask. What you want to ask is how good a, a model of vernacular reasoning is logic. It's a terrible one. It's a very bad one. It's, uh, it has nothing to do with vernacular reasoning. So I'll, now let me backtrack. Because uh, in the paper version of, of this, I'm a lot more careful about about this. I don't think logic is about vernacular reasoning first and foremost. I think logic is about, you know, the objective conditions for correct inference, where inference is not to be thought as a sort of uh, psychological process, certainly not as a sort of process that's only open to um, human uh, human agents, but rather as a sort of, now I'm going to go a bit circular, but don't worry about that, as a sort of mathematically describable uh, uh, transition between certain, uh, certain entities. Um, so, yes, uh, if you are talking about, if we are talking about vernacular reasoning, definitely, I would say obviously so, mainly because logic is 
it's terrible <laughs> at, uh, at doing it with the core doubt that despite appearances to the contrary, I'm really not interested in vernacular in, 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 in uh, vernacular uh, reasoning. And going back to the first question, right, classical logic. So when I said that I think Dhammit is right rather than I said that intuition is, is the one through logic, I was obviously kidding, but uh, I wasn't misrepresenting my biography. Uh, I still think that you know, there's something that intuitionistic logic gets right more than there is intuitionistic logic improves in respect to, uh, to, classical, uh, to classical logic. Um, of course, officially, I'm pluralist. Uh, I'm a logical pluralist, so I think that yeah, many logics will, uh, will serve. Yeah, I really don't know how to answer the how to answer the question because it really depends on how much, as it were. So I'm going to take that as an empirical question or a question about an empirical uh, uh, matter, and then it all boils down to you know how how much do you want to invest in in your tools? Classical logic is simple. Uh, pretty much you're forced to learn it. Uh, uh, I mean, there's at least, you know, uh, I don't know, I would think 40% of uh, the programs in any decent university will offer you the opportunity to learn classical logic. So it's, in most cases, it's going to be the best tool you've, uh, you've got. Uh, there's a lot of literature in the wake of Watson's uh, card test. Uh, that actually argues that classical logic stand uh, as a starting guide for uh, investigating uh, vernacular, vernacular uh, reasoning. It's just a wrong tool. Uh, I would give you the reference, but uh, I, Stenning is the second author. I mean, I'm talking about review papers, and Lam is the first author. Uh, I have the reference on that. Um, so, yeah, it might be that it's just the best and easiest tool to come across. It's pretty rubbish uh, uh, on, uh, on its own. Uh, if, if I got the questions wrong. Yes, fair enough. Uh, and really, I'm not for the, the second question, so the first answer. I have a quick follow up. I just wonder. What is the statue of logical objects according to you? Are you kind of Platonist in some way? Uh, <laughs> yeah, because you, you, you basically mean that it exists in some way independently of uh, human reasoning? Or oh, it's the way I understood it, at least. Can I take a pass on that? <laughs> <laughs> it's I might end up, you know, be, so, okay. I'm happy to think of them as abstract objects. Now, I love abstract objects. I mean, frankly, my only friends are abstract objects. So I think that that's more of a problem than, you know, a problem with myself than whatever. Uh, do I believe that they are? Objective in some sense, yes. Um, do I also believe that they exist in a sort of realm of their own, you know, Fregian, uh, uh, third reality or what not? Yeah, no. Uh, so I suppose I would be a sort of a species of realist to the extent that I, I, I believe that, you know, this is. These are objects of which objective 
truth value wise discourse is possible uh, but I don't think that you know, these, these have a sort of special ontological uh, uh, status that I, th I think I'm a constructivist Brewer uh, thought that you can talk objectively about mathematics although it's all in your head, provided, of course. I mean, actually, Brewer thought that it's in his head. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. A kind of condition, possibility condition for yeah. the abstract so but I, I said in the last yeah, like yeah, transcendentalism yeah. in that sense a lot but, more. But which is not related to human mind right. necessarily, yeah. otherwise. Yeah. <laughs> it was tough. I think Peter was next. Yeah. Uh, so I'm wondering, thanks a lot for the presentation, by the way, it was excellent. Uh, but I was wondering uh, in how far this constructionist thing is very different from old fashioned Carnapian explication. Uh, you know, it seems very similar, and, 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 and for me, that always did the trick and didn't have to go too fancy. <laughs> No, but what is what is added uh, to to that thought? A cool name. <laughs> uh, no, that that's that's not correctly. That's not actually true. So, from what I've said, not much. And frankly, I don't care uh, about. The construction is story in you know beyond mm, many of the things that one could have recovered out of a sort of Carnapian uh, 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 explanation uh, explanation story. I've uh, <coughs> well in in a sense again one of the reasons why I wanted to stay away from Carnap. Uh, apart from the ways that he's getting abused in the conceptual engineering uh, literature, is uh, his sort of overarching uh, conventionalism. Uh, which, at least when you are talking about logic, you know, it becomes kind of kinda problematic. Mm -hmm. uh, if not in actuality, then at least connotation, uh, uh, connotation wise. Mm -hmm. uh, but okay, that, so that's that's one one way of answering. Uh, uh, if you want the question, is the strong similarities between a sort of Carnapian explanation project and the sort of uh, thing you get out of uh, out of constructionism. Uh, you talk again about replay. I mean. Carnap is talking about replacing concepts with uh, uh, with better concepts. Here, you know, sure, the observables are conceptual in the sense that they are not, you know, as in empirical science, things that you can actually observe. In some cases, uh, uh, naked uh, naked eye. Um, and there might be some minute sort of differences uh, 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 of architecture of uh, you know the mini the mini projects if you have a sort of uh, project of constructing a model a la constructionist or a project of providing a Carnapian explanation they might uh, they might sort of uh, sort of differ. What? Um, but to do justice to the constructionists, uh, so the tools seem to be a bit more sophisticated. At least when they are self uh, self reflective, <laughs> you know, operating in self uh, self reflective uh, mode, and. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Mm -hmm. I think Pilar is next. Okay. 
Yeah, thanks a lot. I am really interesting and have several questions, but I'm going to start with it. So, I, I don't know if that's just one question or two. Um, I was uh, in trying to, to um, understand the distinction between logical model and, and constructivism. I was trying to think of a situation. So I, I guess the logical model, as I understand it, if for whatever reason uh, we couldn't use these junctions and we only use, like as normal speakers, uh, it's equivalent in a, in a conditional, for instance, the logical model have a completely different logic and with this junction wouldn't have a, um, a role in the logic. They could be introduced as equivalent but not um, being connected. And in the case, or what you want to defend is that even if we don't use these junctions as uh, they are, so that wouldn't have any impact on the right logic that we want, we would like to model. Is it right? It's not wrong. Uh, I mean, I think I may have given this impression. Uh, they have slightly more sophisticated. So that, that, that's a good analogy. Uh, you know, but I, I think it'd be unfair to the logic as modeling uh, uh, people to give the impression that. That's all that this is. Uh, this is all uh, uh, all about because. So you might think that you know, given that there's a disjunction in natural language, then ended up with a formal language that you know, say it's a classical formal language only has conjunction and uh, uh, and negation, which is perfectly enough. Uh, you know, the lack of. A primitive disjunction is sort of artifactual, right? And that's certainly something that they would agree with, and you know, it's it's correct, uh, as it were. Um, but it's very sort of very simple, uh, 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 simple, simple case, and then you know, things get fluffier or hairier. Uh, if you are, so the standard, if, if you are looking at you know more complicated models, and the standard example in the literature, which was provoked by them, has to do with vagueness, for instance. So suppose that you are operating with a model of vagueness that uh, uh, uses sort of realism between zero and one uh, as your assignments of value to. Uh, uh, to sentences containing um, vague predicates. Uh, now that's obviously, you know, uh, artifactual. Why zero to one rather than seventeen to forty-seven? Uh, you know, it's the same. It's the same thing uh, uh, in a sense. But there's there's a sort of legitimate worry that even when you are doing that, you are still doing something wrong. Uh, because you are assigning a precise numerical value, right, to something that your intuition tells you should not be precisely quantifiable, right? I mean, that's the, the whole point of, you know, yeah, tallish, you know, uh, if, if vagueness is not epistemic, for instance, then, you know, the point of saying that somebody is kind of tall is not saying that they have a height below, uh, above uh, 0.72, right? Uh, and it's not that it's wrong to say that, it's more than assigning a determinate uh, uh, value is wrong. And even if you think of reals as a kind of set, uh, that still doesn't cut it because you know every real is going to be a precise set, and really you should be thinking in terms of fuzzy sets. But then you know, uh, you, <laughs> which is uh, right. So it, that's that's the sort of uh, that's the sort of worries that really animate uh, uh, them. But. So 
So going back to the constructionist, I think I might have given the impression that this is so that they are freer or significantly freer. And in a sense, that's true. In a sense, uh, uh, it's not. Because if you think in terms of you know, setting up a model of a certain phenomenon, I mean, whether you're a modelist or a constructionist, you're still going to be kind of bound by pre-knowledge, uh, uh, as it were, by uh, things you know or notice about your target. Uh, target phenomenon. You know, if you're talking about language and logic, you might think that, you know, there's really no need to represent natural language or English using Fregean syntax. Right? But you might think at the same time that there's still the need to kind of represent in this whatever syntax I have uh, the logical uh, the logical operations. Because that's or what I take to be the logical operation. So even a constructionist is sort of bound by uh, information, pre-theoretical, if you want, information about the target system. I think the, the difference is mainly one of sort of emphasis. Uh, I think that the first folk, the modelists, as it were, are still paying way too much attention to making sure that the models are accurate. Uh, uh, innocent, which is why they are worried about the representatives versus artifacts. But uh, the logical modeling is, is not linguistics. It's not, so there is no. also a normative um, dimension. It's not, this is how people reason. It's an idealization of. So there is an idealization of this is what people do, and then I don't know. It's more question. I don't really know. Uh, I'm trying also now to, to draw a distinction between linguistics, pure linguistics, about even about the, the notion of follows from the linguistic kind of study and the logical model. Yeah. Well, that's. I mean, the Cook at least very very uh, voice vociferously uh, uh, hints at the fact that he sort of thinks, thinks of uh, Lord urges us to think of logic the same way one would think about linguistics uh, in a sense, you know, as being merely descriptive. Sure, it might provide you with more information, right, because things are simpler, etc., and there's always that impossibly long bloody inference that nobody has ever drawn uh, or ever will be, but that logic, you know, kind of can, can handle, but that's not to be understood uh, in any sort of normative, uh, normative sense. It's really to be understood as a sort of description of the of the practice. I mean, again, I think Karnak comes in here <coughs> because for various purposes, various models might be better or, or worse. And if you've got to pick which one, then you, you are facing a, 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 an external question in, uh, in Karnak's uh, Karnab sense. But the better of the logic as modeling view has to be first and foremost a descriptively better. So it's, you know, that model is the answer you give to the question which of the two models that I have provides me a more accurate description of the target phenomenon given my interests, right? The constructionist is going to give you the same sort of thing, I am model, but is going to give that while answering the question which model is going to give me a more efficient representation of the problems I want to tackle. 
and the representation here is non-representation <laughs> as it were. I mean, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, okay, Charles. Yeah, I wanted to. This is this is good because this is in the same kind of direction. Um, <laughs> But I'm not a logician, so I'm going to ask it in a very different way um, and go kind of sociological. So it strikes me that one thing that's interesting about this constructivist view is that it would have an upshot for how we should fight about logic and literature, right? So if we all become constructivist, so there should can be. I, can yeah. I just, because I know that you, yeah. me. Sorry. <laughs> yes, thank you. I caught myself when I said it. Yes, not constructivist already means something. Yeah. Um, very else. Um, so if we're constructionists, um, it seems to me that there should be a healthy genre of papers in the literature where we argue in a kind of hybrid of logic and pragmatics about the adequacy of our tools to our ends, right? And so I'm wondering if, and this, so this is because, of, because I'm not a logician, I'm actually wondering if, do you think that Actually, those papers are already there, and once you become a constructionist, you realize that, hey, a lot of these fights that we've already been having, they're actually exactly this fight about sort of how good is the tool for the job. Or do you actually think that, like, no, this would make logical practice better because, like, we're not having these arguments. And actually, we should be having this debate more directly with this sort of avowedly pragmatic flair about, like, are the tools that we're building adequate to do the job that we want them to do? Yeah, okay, that's a neat one. Uh, yes and no. Um, so there's certainly almost no literature that's self uh, consciously uh, representing itself as being about that. Oh, look. I, I provide you with a sort of better, uh, as it were, set of tools or whatever. Mm -hmm. That's because we are, you know, philosophers. We don't care about tools or how good they are. We just care about you being wrong. <laughs> That's all that matters. <laughs> I mean, you know, all that matters is that somebody else is wrong. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm no, 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 uh, yeah, almost kidding, yeah. Uh, no, so there's very little self-representation in that, in that respect. Many of the things that people have said in one way or another, you know, can be reinterpreted. And as, so logic is somewhere in, in the spectrum between philosophy and mathematics. Uh, Provided there's, there's a sort of interest in this broad sort of topic of, you know, being, I think the Italians would say consapevole, right? sort of aware of what you are doing, uh, the more you move from the philosophy side to the, to the uh, mathematics side, the more you are going to find, you know, proposals. Uh, advertise something as being you know, a slightly better tool, a more efficient approach to, etc. Uh, uh, et so, you know, these this people, which tend to be French, which tend to be connected with Girard, which tend to be living therefore in Marseille or thereabouts, who care a lot about uh, computational complexity, right? Uh, Right. Computational complexity is a very, very sort of important uh, instrumental, if you want. Even the philosophers who do that know that they're working on a tool. And stuff. Exactly, yeah, yeah. 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 So, yeah. It, uh, wrong. Uh, now, you know, philosophers will try to make a big fuss of the failures of, uh, or, you know, failures or in insufficiencies in terms of computational complexity. Girard's mathematician postdocs just churn out <laughs> results. Uh, 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 sigma pi, etc. I have no idea what they're talking about, but it looks fun. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, 
Yeah. On the other hand, many of what there is can be approached <coughs> in, in, in that sense. And there's glimpses of that. You know, so for instance, there's people who are saying, well, you know, intuition is mathematicians or logicians and classical mathematicians. They are arguing about all sorts of things, but really they shouldn't be arguing all that much. Because you can look at the intuitionist as just sort of <coughs> being what's the name? sociopathically uh, interested in, uh, in a subclass of uh, results that are available to the classical mathematicians, i.e. those that are constructively uh, uh, obtainable. So I guess that leaves open the last little bit. So do you think it's a, uh, the normative side? So do you think that, that, that it's a conclusion of the view that we should be doing more of that kind of stuff, like the mathematicians do? More sort of self-avowed tool evaluation kind of stuff? Can I pass on that? You can pass on that. <laughs> You're allowed to pass on that. I think it all depends on the evolution of the job market. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. Uh, That's fair. Okay, has anyone, is, does anyone who has not asked a question yet want to ask a question? Okay, then I can ask a question. <laughs> okay, so thanks a lot, great talk. I wanted to uh, push you a little bit more about why not substar skin meta inferences. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> just, uh, so as, as part of motivating my question, so it looks like, so, in the indetermination phenomena, I don't know if you agree with that, but I think one could say that some of the, those uh, indetermination phenomena are kind of like, not accidental, but I mean, so you, you can formulate the electricity logic in a multiple conclusion sequence, but it will, last, it will lack some like, natural properties or you can formulate uh, like invertibility or something like that. Or you can uh, formulate a classical logic in a single conclusion uh, uh, sequence calculus. But again, you would lose like the elegance of the multiple conclusion. So even though uh, you have this indeterminacy, they, that it might be the case that, I don't know if it's the case for all the cases of indeterminacy, but in, in, mo in, in a lot of salient, salient cases, I think it's fair to say that it's not completely arbitrary to single out like one most natural candidate as like uh, and, the, and the sources of indeterminacies are kind of like uh, some technical accidents okay it's, it turns out to be possible to present it in another way and and then uh, it seems like if you accept this kind of indeterminacy as a as a as a legitimate source of worry or then you, you can i mean it's not a, like a necessitation but it, kind of get the same kind of worries if it turns out that you can present uh, like meta inferential calculi that are that become like subtarskian. Uh, I mean I, I don't I wouldn't know how to do it technically but I, I would doubt it's like impossible to uh, to uh, to have the same sort of like alternative formulations um, that are subtarskian and uh, and then so the, the question is like What's wrong with them? Uh, why should we stick to uh, to Tarski and meta inferences? Right. Uh, so the, there's a lot that's going on in in motivation. A lot that I agree with, and okay. a lot that actually connects with my sort of fastest, with my thesis, with my my talk, which it was that you know these are not very very strong arguments. Uh -huh. They are just sort of giving you a flavor. They just sort of bait to pull you on the side of the meta-inferentialist rather than, you know, knock out uh, arguments against mm -hmm. the uh, 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 inferentialist yeah. uh, 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 view. Um, so with a lot of that, I'm actually in full, uh, in full agreement. Now, Subtarsky and, and meta-inferential, this is a rather complicated uh, uh, story and it's actually technical. So here, here's one way of looking at it. When I'm saying that a certain logic 
is reflexive from the meta-inferential standpoint, what I'm saying is that this sequence, no, let me write it as, a, as an identity sequence. Uh, what I'm saying is that this sequence uh, entails itself, mm -hmm. right? The, the brackets are just for uh, visual uh, uh, clarification. Now, entailment, semantically, this, this, this relation of entailment here, uh, ends up being uh, a preservationist relation. In my favorite case, is going to be uh, a relation that preserves satisfiability. The satisfiability of sequence rather than the uh, validity. So to say that you know a sequence entails itself means that roughly any valuation that satisfies that sequence in premise position is a valuation that satisfies that same sequence in uh, in um, uh, sequence position. So basically, if you want to think algebraically about it, you are in a space in which you have two truth values, I'm going to call them six, which is satisfied, and seven, which is unsatisfied. Six is designated, right? Uh, seven is non-designated, right? Uh, and consequence is defined preservationistically, right? Now it's easy to prove that any relation of this kind is task -y. right? The only thing that's kind of an idea it might also be a Scott relation, so it might also be a, a multiple conclusion. That's the only thing that's not ruled out for free, although it's ruled out in some cases, like, you know, if you go subvaluationist or supervaluation. Uh, okay, so that's the, sort of the first, as it were, descriptive part of, of the answer, namely that the, the task and character of the, of the relation is sort of unavoidable because it's just a mathematical property, if you want, of, of the syntax of the sequence on the one and in, in one way, or the, or, 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 or the properties of a logical space in which consequence is preservationist, and you are operating with two values. Okay, so you want to get, you know, you want that not to be the case. You want that not exactly. to happen, because you want to go sub, exactly. sub task. Well, you can do it. Except the way you do it, or the way you need to do it, and this is, this is stuff that's been done by Eduardo Bayo with Federico Pilos and Damian uh, Smook. Oh, I can't remember how to spell Damian's last name, but if you know the rest. So where's the Z? It's after S, right? I have a Z. <laughs> uh, that's that's the uh, that was the problem. I'm sorry, Damian, if you're anywhere, please. <laughs> sorry. Uh, so, how the I mean, if you already know the story, then why are you asking me? Because no, you already I know I what they are doing. So what they are doing is actually they are uh, sort of breaking down the. The, the preservation is dimension of this thing because they are evaluating premise uh, premise position sequence according to one sort of standard of uh, uh, satisfiability, so they call it standard alpha, and then you know they are evaluating the second according to a standard that's beta, and it, which is this thing from uh, from. Alpha. They might be related, they might even be, you know, sort of generated or at least generable one from the other, which is exactly what happens, but they are nonetheless uh, uh, distinct. Now, 
if you are like me, what you're going to believe that happens here is that this is in fact a convocation and that this relation does not say that this sequent entails uh, the same sequent. This is going to say that this sequent uh, mark right, entails this sequent another mark, uh, which is a different relation from the one that you want reflexivity to, uh, um, to be. Now, I got ripped to bits by a referee, because I said that, because the referee said, oh, but you have a definition of what a sequent is. A sequence is just a pair uh, of sets of formula from a certain uh, from a certain language. And if you take that view, then you should be referring to papers. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm kidding. Uh, so if, if you take take that view, what I'm saying here about equivocation doesn't doesn't hold water, but um, you know this is more than just pure syntax uh, in a weird language. It's more about you know how do I syntactically define uh, sequence. It's about what's the sort of information they carry. And Francesca and I we've got a story about what this is. Uh, the story is. You know, our sequences are, in a sense, interpreted entities. They mean something. It's not something as straightforward as you know, being an inference, but they mean something. And what they mean is strong enough to, uh, to support this claim that there's a equivocation uh, uh, going on here. So the, the answer to the question is, yes, you can go subtaskian, but you're equivocated. When you are saying, oh, look, this is reflexivity, you are wrong, right? Uh, so if, if you remember the actual example, uh, or rather the simplest example in the, uh, uh, in the Buenos Aires plan, uh, what happens here is that this is going to be a uh, non-reflective, non-reflexive uh, logic in which, you know, A, Intels A might hold for a particular choice of A, but it doesn't uh, doesn't hold uh, as a rule, right? Whereas this one here, or yeah, so this relation is non-reflexive, and this one is non-transitive. Well, I'm saying that uh, this is not. When you're saying that this holds, you this doesn't hold. You are not saying that yeah, that it's this sequence that fails to entail itself. What you are saying is that this sequence fails to entail another uh, sequence. So this is a case of Humberstone style heterogeneous yeah. logics rather than a failure of um, uh, repetitivity in, in one, one logic. Uh, but that's not what yeah. uh, 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 Federico and Alejandro just a quick follow up, but it's ready for later discussion over here. So it turns out that with, with Peter and Pilar, we are interested in, uh, in, in meta instances, like some kind of meta inferential sequence calculi that are sub star scheme, but because the, the arrow that you have in the middle is supposed to express grounding. Oh. So that's so you expect it to be non scheme and <coughs> you can represent the idea is to start with calculi like that and then get to the full presentation of classical logic or any other logic. So, do you want to recreate the hierarchy, the transfinite hierarchy on the grounding? Uh, not transfinite. I mean, maybe you can talk okay. later. I don't want to hijack the discussion from our work. It's, it's, you are the star here. Yeah, that, but that's, 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 kind of, that's kind of where part of the reason why I wanted to know more about uh, this. Mm -hmm. But there might be other questions. Uh, so, that's, sorry, <laughs> that's, uh, let me just answer this question. That's a perfectly legitimate, uh, legitimate move. Because if that double arrow there means something like grounding, 
<coughs> you know, you are not bound by uh, anything to do with satisfiability, exactly. anything to do with preservation of anything. You are just sort of. Uh, You're bounded by those things, but it's even stronger. It's stricter. It's yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Those things, right. But on top of the. A bit more, yeah, strictly speaking. Peter? So I, it's kind of related to Pierre's question, but uh, do meta inferentialists um, need arguments to avoid dropping to meta meta inferentialism and meta 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 inferentialism? Uh, or is it just like, can you be? Just confirming that this is a good level of, of, of complication, of, of abstraction, and we don't. So there's two things that can happen here, uh, right? Um, so you go to the first meta inferential level. I apologize <coughs> to the other people. Trust me, this discussion doesn't have a, doesn't make any sense. I mean, once <laughs> yeah, meta inference is bad. Enough. When you get meta, 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 meta inference, you should go home. <laughs> <laughs> Again, sorry for <laughs> the audience. <laughs> so, <coughs> there's two things that happen once you are the first meta inferential level. If you stick to the criteria uh, of validity judgment that you've applied there, then everything above. Uh, is going to correspond nicely to the first uh, meta inferential level. So, yes, you can go. Why should you? Because it's just a uh, syntactic translation in increasingly more complex levels, but they are really compactable, uh, if you want, no point. <coughs> if you want to go in a way that's not 100% tributary to the first meta-inferential level, then you need to go uh, Buenos Aires style, mm -hmm. which in my book means that you are committing an error because you are uh, uh, equivocating. Uh, many people don't think that you are equivocating, for instance. I just don't understand. I mean, many people who are not in Buenos Aires. <laughs> so, for instance, uh, you know, Dave is quite adamant that the determination of the standards of goodness for the, the meta-sequential uh, uh, inference relation is kind of independent at pretty much every level, and somehow it still makes sense to... So he says that, oh, look, if... if, if if you have a standard of satisfiability that applies at level one, uh, that doesn't mean that you need to hold on to it at the second uh, at the second level. But at the same time, you still get to talk about the same entities uh, as at the first level, and I just can't wrap my uh, my head around that. I can see where Dave's coming from, but I just don't see why he doesn't see the obvious. <laughs> I, in fact, you, uh, you can't. So if you are my kind of meta-inferentialist, then you are going to style yourself as a finitist, meta-inferentialist of the first level. That's as far as you need to go. Because if you go higher, you're either wrong or just taking a stroll in the dark, which is very nice. It doesn't solve any problems. Okay, that's a bad analogy. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe because strolling in the park can solve many problems. But, yeah, but uh, so the um, <coughs> from a constructionist point of view, I guess, uh, is it <coughs> the stroll in the park? Uh, can you exclude it? So like, if it's <coughs> no, but I, um, no. yeah, yeah, no, no. And I, I mean, there's nothing wrong with looking at it. Yeah, you know, with looking at what what happens at higher meta inferential level. It's just that you know, there's no game uh, there, and that's enough 
to not go there. Exactly. So it's not, in a sense, the problem of whether you need one meta-inferential level or 77 meta-inferential levels is, um, what's the name? It's debunked. It's It's irrelevant because every higher level is going to behave in the relevant respects as the first level. Mm -hmm. So but that, that's an interesting feature, and, and it seems like philosophically speaking, that what you really are doing is instead of being meta inferentialist, being inferentialist at all levels higher than the first inference. I mean, you know, yes, yeah. it seems like you're not. The, the right level of, um, of modelizing you're doing, I mean, well, it's constructionist modelizing, um, is not only for the meta inferential level, but also for everything more than inferential, you know? Yeah. Okay. Even though that technically that may not make a difference, but, but if we want to know what you're really talking about, it may make a difference. So, so oh, yeah, I see. Uh, I skipped this because why not? Uh, but the official statement of the inferentialist position, of the affinities meta inferentialist position, is actually the following. A logic is determined as a consequence relation uh, on sequence as well as any other consequence relation that start, that's block Jonson similar to that, uh, that relation. Now, Brogans and similarity here just means that, uh, you know, the two consequence relations are uh, mutually translatable, salva uh, consequentia, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, although I say that consequence is between sequence, that doesn't prevent me from seeing identifying the same consequence relation between formula, for instance, provided I can translate my sequence into, into formula, which of course I can. Uh, and the same happens up the hierarchy mm -hmm. if you avoid uh, Buenos Aires style uh, equivocation. So it's always possible, if you stick to that thing there, it's always possible to, def to, to show that the consequence relation that you get at level 67, which is a consequence relation between meta influences of level 66, uh, is uh, in fact block Jonson similar with the consequence relation that you get at level 1, mm -hmm. and therefore they are one and, uh, and the same. Right. Okay. So. <laughs> Thanks. I think we are out of time. So you need to reserve your questions for the peer session. Thanks, mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.